All right, you guys, as you can see by the title, I'm back with another one like the other one. And yes, I am going to get straight to it. So check it out, you guys. This story right here, this incident and several other incidents that are related to the main incident. This all happened after the Afghanos and the Sureños got into that big riot in Pelican Bay. I want to say that this kicked off somewhere around 2006, 2007. And, you know, after... After that incident, right after that incident and the years before that, as far as I know, and I could be wrong, but Nathaniels were not programming on A and B facility on those those two yards in Pelican Bay. Those were yards where they were being told if they landed on those yards, that they, they better get off because they were going to end up, you know, getting victimized out there. The Southsiders weren't having it. They weren't letting Nathaniels program over, you know, on either one of those two yards. I just told you guys a story about you know, Palomino, when he was holding down one of those yards, and I know this probably came after because obviously, you know, Palomino didn't get out there to these main lines until after, you know, the Todd Ashker and Danny Troxel, until those, you know, that, that class action suit prevailed. But, you know, that just goes to show that there were, you know, there were things happening on those main lines, you know, that concerned North Daniels programming out there. They weren't having it. At that time, Palomino was allowing the Bulldogs to coexist out there with the understanding that if North Daniels pulled up, they were to take off. Anyways, again, as far as I know, and I do remember, you know, some North Daniels that were in Quentin with me when, you know, they were leaving C-section and they were catching buses out. They were being told, hey, if you land up there in Pelican Bay on the main lines, you better get off on the you know a facility and b facility again i could be wrong so don't quote me on that and understand i've never been to pelican bay mainline i've done all my time in the shoot program so i'm a little you know unclear as to how the yard is set up how many buildings what's where what building is what you know what building is orientation so on and so forth but in the big scheme of things, if I get anything wrong as far as how many buildings, what's where, so what? I know there's some of you that are going to be like, no, nah, I don't know, it was this one. Uh -uh, there's, there's, there's that. And, it, and nope, there's six, not five. And nope, it was orientation was two, not three. It doesn't change the story. It doesn't change the story. So, you know, let me, let me just tell my story and then I'll get up out the way. Then you guys can beat me up in the comments. Anyways, like I said, this this incident, the main incident that I'm going to tell you guys about, you know, there were several other incidents that led up to it. And at one time it kicked off on B yard. One time it kicked off on a yard. It was just back and forth because what was happening was, is, you know, there was a time when the administration, I guess they were trying to phase North Daniels out to that main line. They were trying, you know, in hopes of getting one or two out there, maybe, you know, these guys will program and, if they can make it out there, you know, we'll send out two or three more and see if they make it and, you know, eventually start, you know, sending a few out, trickling them out slowly. But again, the Southsiders weren't having it. They send a couple out to, to A yard, they get off. They send them out to B yard and the same thing would happen until, you know, eventually new faces probably ended up on the yard, you know, Different things were happening. Different people were in, you know, in control out there on, on the main lines and North Angels were allowed to program out there. You know, first there was two or three that turned into five, six and seven. And then eventually they got their numbers up. So I'm going to talk about that, how the North Angels ended up, you know, landing on a facility, then B facility, then a facility, then, you know, until eventually they started a program and then something kicked up. So, like I said, there were several incidents that, you know, ended up leading to the main incident. But at different points throughout this story, these incidents took place on both these yards. This happened, I want to say, around 2006, 2007. Don't quote me on it, but I know it was, you know, several years after the Suranos and the Africanos got into that big, that big melee up there. And, you know, at, at, at different times, you know, when these incidents kicked off, as far as I know and as far as I understood, buildings one and building two in a facility were both ad seg buildings. Building three was considered like an ad seg overflow slash orientation block. And the thing that I was told about, you know, the orientation block, that's like 
a block that everybody got to go to the orientation block when they first drive up. And you got nothing coming when you're going through orientation. Basically, you get put in a cell. You got to wait until you go to classification, until they kick you out to a yard, they classify you. And during that time, you know, you don't have nothing. You don't have a, a TV. You don't have a radio. You got the bare minimum. And again, you know, according to my source, who I am now going to be calling Stomper, you know, when you went to the orientation building, you didn't have shit coming. And there were some cats that were housed in the orientation building because it was kind of like an overflow slash, like I said, orientation. And sometimes it was also a slash ad seg overflow. So you had several cats that were programming in, you know, building three, but there was nobody in there to really, you know, to really control these individuals. So they were off the hook. They were, you know, being disrespectful, staying up all night, you know, playing radios after everybody else shuts down. You know, there's people that got jobs. There's people that are waking up in the morning and they're getting ready to, to go out there and visit their family. So, you know, they don't want to stay up all night listening to a couple cats get drunk, banging on the doors, you know, shit like that. But that's what was going on in, you know, the orientation building in building three, as far as I know. So, like I said, it wasn't until around this time that they started trying to put the North Daniels out there on a yard and they didn't put them out there in, in big numbers. You know, like I was saying, they just gradually trickled them out to see, you know, what would happen. Because at that time, the war was still on between the Northanios and the Sureños. The agreement to end hostilities was not in effect yet. So, you know, that war was still on. And on several yards, you know, several yards throughout different prisons, a lot of level fours, the war was, was still in full effect. And Pelican Bay was one of them. Now, when they started putting these Northanios out there on, on a facility, from my understanding, again, they started to put a good majority of them in the orientation building, in building three. Even the ones that, you know, after they went through orientation, they still kept them there because they weren't really sure if these guys were going to stay on the yard. So they kept them in, in, in building three and they basically just monitored them why, you know, they were kind of just like monitoring the yard too to see what was going to happen between them and the Sureños. So unfortunately for them, a lot of them had to stay in this, this building that was like a, you know, it was at nighttime, it, it was a crazy house, the way that Stomper described it to me. There was no respect. So according to Stomper, something else that he told me is that, you know, when they first started putting these Nortanios out there on, on a yard, the Sureños that were out there at that time, they weren't tripping on them. There was just a couple of them out there. And the, these Nortanios that were out there, they were trying to program. You know, the administration, I guess the administration, this is what Stomper told me that kind of didn't make sense. But, you know, I believe he's giving me a, a, the true story. But he said that the administration gave the North Daniels their own bars to work out on. And that kind of confused me because normally, you know, that kind of stuff is worked out amongst the inmates. Why the administration would say, hey, this is your guys' bar right here and everybody else on the yard would respect it. I don't know, but that's the story that I was given. He was like, hey, the administration gave them their own bar. And, you know, there was just a couple of them out there. And the bars that they gave them were like right there in front of the program office, right in front of the uh, a gun tower. They were like right there on front street. I don't know if they were just like watching them, but, you know, that's that's what he said. Now, again, the other thing that he said was that these Nortenos, obviously, they were well aware of the fact that you know, previously before them, there was no Nortanios out there programming on these yards. So these guys were out there, you know, they were keeping their heads down. They were they were out there just trying to program, stay out the way. They weren't trying to bring no attention to themselves. They were just trying to stay out the way. It wasn't like, you know, they were su submitting to anybody or they were being, you know, they were being bullied around out there. It was nothing like that. And I believe that these guys were probably out there trying to stay low profile because they were smart. They were trying to get their numbers up. You know, they couldn't go out there and, you know, go out there and try to push some hard lines on the yard. That's not how you try to establish a yard. If, you know, there's nobody out there on the yard and you're just breaking ground and you go out to a main line like this, you know, I would think the best thing for you to do is to just, you know, play your hand right, 
keep a low profile and, you know, make it so that you can get, you know, other homies out there. The open, had the door open for that other homies could, could land out there on the yard as well. And that's what ended up happening. You know, they started to get their numbers up. First, there was five or six. That turned into seven, eight, nine. Before you know it, there was like 15 of them out there. But the one thing that Stomper did say is that, you know, as they got, as their numbers increased, they started to get more comfortable. You could just tell by the way that they started to walk around the yard. They started to walk a little bit more aggressively, a little bit more pep in their step. But, I mean, hey, that's what they were doing. They were building their numbers. So, you know, they're out there. They're wearing their colors now, and they're, they're getting more comfortable. And I guess apparently what started happening was is some of these youngsters, you know, that were walking around with their chest poked out, they started peeling off their shirts and, you know, walking around, showing off their tattoos. And for the most part, the Sureños weren't tripping off of the Welga Burrs or the 14s or the Nortes because, I mean, just that practically every Norteño has those kind of tattoos. But it wasn't until a Norteño, you know, a young Norteño pulled up that, and I believe he was from Salinas. I'm not sure, but this, this, you know, youngster in particular had a big SK on his on his shoulder. You know, so basically this this youngster that had SK on his shoulder, he started walking around the yard. You know, he started walking around more without his shirt. And, you know, Sureños started feeling disrespected out there. You know, they started to see that SK. And it was just a way that this youngster was carrying himself and the way that he peeled off his shirt that they felt like he was disrespecting them like he was purposely, you know, throwing that in their face. But that was just one of several incidents that had just started, you know, to come into play out there. Basically, what really started to cause problems out there is the Sureños that were housed in Building 3, you know, it was probably a mixture of, of that that was going on on the yard with these Norteños now that are walking around, you know, without their shirts and, you know, flagging their colors now that, you know, that disrespect was just starting to permeate out there. It was just, you know, starting to come to the surface. But the Sureños that were housed in Building 3, what what they were doing was they didn't have any, any you know, any leadership in that building, nobody to give them guys direction. And according to Stomper, a lot of these guys were YA babies. They were youngsters that had never been around North Daniels never had programmed around North Daniels. And basically, you know, they were being very disrespectful. They apparently thought that they could disrespect these guys and there'd be no repercussions that, you know, they could treat them like, like busters and, and farmeros. And, you know, these guys would just accept it because there was, you know, there was only about 10 or 15 of them. So like I was saying, these guys, these youngsters would be staying up all night. They started drinking Pruno, you know, in the middle of the night. They'd be up, you know, listening to oldies, talking on the tier, holding conversations, playing chess on the tier, just, you know, completely disrespecting everybody else in the building. And again, you know, for the most part, everybody that was in that building, they were just, they were just, you know, they were in transit. They were just hitting the yard and a lot of them were going to end up out there in one of the buildings. This was just a, a temporary, you know, pit stop for them. But the North Daniels were being kept in there. So they're the ones that had to stay up night after night and hear the disrespect that, you know, that was going on in that building. You know, it ended up getting so bad. The disrespect got so bad in that building that there's two staircases over there and they didn't trust each other. There was so much tension in the building that the Sureños would use one staircase to go up and down and the Norteños would use the other staircase to go up and down. They just didn't trust each other. That's how much tension was, was in that building. And, you know, he had said something to the effect of, you know, when the Norteño was out there showering, you know, the Sureños would wait until the Norteños were done before they would come out and before they would lock it up in their cell until they would start showering. So there was there was some crazy shit going on in that building. And it was all behind disrespect. So building three ended up being ground zero for, you know, everything that would later happen. It was, you know, that building where the disrespect started, where it was more prevalent, 
you know, a lot of the, the Surayans that were in that building felt like, you know, there was nobody in there that they had to answer to. So they were they were running with it. You know, they were running with it. You have situations like this right here. It's just a matter of time before something kicks off. It's just a matter of, you know, time before somebody either pulls up and says, hey, what the fuck's going on here? You know what I'm saying? You guys are you guys are tolerating this shit. Or, you know, somebody else on the other side is just like, hey, man, fuck these cats. You know what I'm saying? Let's, let's just straight just smash them. They ain't got shit coming up in here. You know what I mean? But basically, it's just it's just a matter of time before something kicks off when you have this kind of disrespect that's, you know, unchecked. You know, if there's no leadership, there's nobody around somebody that, you know, knows how to implement some level of respect on the yard. You know, the youngsters, they'll eventually get out of control. And that's that's what happened. There was a Sureño named Trigger from Ventura that was running the yard for the Sureños. But he apparently ran a real loose program. And that was according to, to uh, Stopper. Another Sureño named Wero from, from Mount Clair, he was also part of the leadership. But apparently, Wedo, he lacked any real experience himself. And, you know, according to Stomper, he said that there was just a lot of young Sureño lifers that ended up in Pelican Bay at that time that had never been around North Daniels. And there was nobody guiding these guys. So, you know, this was just, it was bound to happen. So while all this was going on, you know, they would trickle out a couple more North Daniels. They're either shoot kickouts or, you know, they were arriving from different prisons, but they send out a couple more and, you know, they started to get more comfortable. Obviously, they get more numbers and, you know, they got more more support out there on the yard. So, you know, as more of them come out there, this this youngster that had this SK, you know, tattooed on the, on his shoulder, you know, he started walking the yard more often, you know, so that the, the Sureños could see. It. And I'm sure he knew, you know, that he was putting it out there on blast. You know, for those of you that don't know, an SK is abbreviated for scrap killer. That's a highly disrespectful and derogatory term that Northaniels use to disrespect, you know, to, to show disrespect towards Sureños. Sureños will also get NK tattooed on, on themselves as well, Northaniel killer. You know, and this is to show their disrespects, you know, their disrespect toward North Daniels as well. You know, so at one point, this youngster's out there, he's walking the track with this big, you know, SK tattooed on his on his shoulder. And, you know, the Sureños, they weren't feeling it. They weren't feeling it. And, you know, they got at their people and somebody that obviously had influence or that was one of their mouthpieces. He ended up approaching one of the North Daniels leaders, somebody who was leading, you know, that yard, running the yard for the North Daniels. And he basically, you know, he let it be known that, hey, this youngster that's walking around out here without his shirt, with that big SK tattoo, you know, on his shoulder, you know, these youngsters out here, they're not feeling it. They're feeling some type of way about that tattoo. And, you know, they're feeling like this dude is purposely, you know, putting this shit in their face, man. You know, homeboy's got to wear his shirt. He can't be out here on the yard, you know, walking around with that tattoo showing. That's just the bottom line. So I'm sure that it caused a lot of tension out there. And back in those days, I'm sure, you know, this also caused a lot of mad dogging and a lot of guys to walk around with their chest poked out. You know, all, all the, the YA games. So from that point, you know, the North Daniel that was running the yard, he obviously goes back and he tells this youngster that, He's probably like, hey, you know what? The Sureños, they got a, they got an issue with that, you know, that SK tattoo on your shoulder. And they want you to keep, you know, keep it covered up. They want you to, you know, keep a shirt on when you're out here. And the youngster's probably like, man, fuck that. I'm not wearing no shirt. Nobody's going to tell me what I can't and what I can't do. You know, that's just the bottom line. And I would imagine anybody is going to react the same way. You know, I'm sure that if a Sureño was approached and told, hey, you got to wear your shirt, you can't, you got to cover up that suit because these North Daniels, they're not feeling it. You'd be like, man, you fucking crazy. You bumped your head. I ain't wearing, I'm not wearing no shirt. I'm going to take my shirt off every time I hit this yard. And if you guys got a problem with it and you're feeling some kind of way, then deal with it. Now, I'm sure that's that's not what happened. You know, there's there's a way that you got to, a, a finesseful way you got to handle situations like this. But the little youngster, he probably played along, you know, initially, or they they 
they went about it some kind of way where you know they, they weren't gonna just kick shit off right right then and there. They probably were like, okay, you know what? It's all gravy, man. You know, we'll we'll talk to the youngster. We'll make sure that he keeps that shit covered up. But you know, in the meantime, in between time, that right there, you know, started some shit. So shit's either gonna kick off or these guys are gonna allow themselves to be dictated. That's basically where they're at now. Now, there's no question about the fact that this tattoo was disrespectful and it's understood why it would be interpreted as, as disrespect. But here's the bottom line. Anywhere else on, on a yard in another prison where both the Nortanos and the Sureños have equal footing, these kinds of tattoos wouldn't become an issue. They're taken as a form of disrespect to anyone that might see them, of course. But on any other yard, nobody's going to tell somebody to put their shirts on. Tattoos like that are common and they're a dime a dozen. The only reason this was being pushed on this yard is because the Nortanios were short on numbers and because they weren't strong on that yard. So for them to comply with any dictates given by the Sureños, especially, you know, when they're being told to put their shirts on and, you know, cover up their tattoos, that would be considered a blatant act of cowardice. It's not about, you know, uh, averting a war or avoiding conflict that's taking it a step further hey these guys these guys are gang bangers you know they 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 all come from backgrounds where they, they're banging on the streets a lot of them come in with artwork that might not be you know might be distasteful to some people but you know to tell somebody that they have to wear a shirt and you know that they feel disrespected those are th those are borderline YA games. Either, you know, you're gonna let that shit go, unless you know this youngster's out there just like purposely walking up and like, hey, check this out, boy, and he's and he's putting his tattoo out there, like you see that right there, you know, something like that. Otherwise, you know, I'm sure the older guys are probably like, so fucking what? Who cares about that little punk ass tattoo? You know, he's stupid for getting that tattoo. He wasted you know that little area on his body to put to put something like that you know so we should feel you know we should feel if anything honored that you know he's shouting this out like that you know what i'm saying but i mean bottom line is what i'm saying is that the older guys they probably wouldn't trip on that it had to have been the youngsters that were like man that, that got hung up on that tattoo you know like i said you know reaching some type of of you know mutual consensus to avoid some type of conflict on the yard, something that's avoidable and, you know, something that's you're not dictating somebody's program is one thing. But to allow themselves to be dictated to the, you know, under the threat of some type of consequence or a reaction, you know, is a form of submission. And that's how this would have been looked at that, you know, they were submitting to the opposition. And these Nortanios obviously knew this. A yard like this where Nortanios are complying with these types of policies is considered a no good yard. That yard would have been considered a no good yard. Other homeboys in different prisons, if they would have heard about, you know, shit that was shit like that that was going on on that yard. And, you know, let's just say a homie was out there and he was programming on that yard and he caught a bus, he caught a chain to another yard. And he gets over there and he starts telling these guys everything that was happening over there. Yeah, you know, the homies were over there, but, you know, there was a youngster from Salas and, you know, he took his shirt off and he had an SK tattoo. And, you know, they told us we couldn't take our shirts off no more. And to hear them say that they complied, they would have been like, what? What the fuck you do? You know, what's going on over there? So that yard would have been considered, you know, a trash yard. They would have been looked at as, you know, these guys are submitting to the opposition. I'm sure, again, it's the same. It would have been the same way with the Southsiders. If they would have been, you know, in a prison like San Quentin that's dominated by North Daniels and they're out there on the yard and they're allowing themselves to be pushed and pulled in different directions, you know, at the hands of the North Daniels, I'm sure their people would be like, nah, fuck, nah, we ain't feeling that. Those guys that are over there that, you know, or on that yard, hey, put them on the least style, uh, homie. You know what I mean? On the on the hard candy list. Those guys, they're no good. You know, because again, active North Daniels, they wouldn't comply with this. In situations like this, where they're being told they can't take their shirts off, or you know, they're being dictated 
to on any level whatsoever, they're supposed to get off. So that's what they did. When all this started to escalate and the, you know, the North Daniels were told that they couldn't take their shirts off, they formulated a plan to take off on a Sureño named Rock from Corona. And supposedly this, this guy Rock was a Sureño that was, that was very disrespectful. He was somebody that was out there on the yard disrespecting the North Daniels. He was always getting drunk, according to Stomper. You know, he wasn't shy about letting it be known that he didn't care for North Daniels at all. He would use the term busters and farmeros, and he would do it openly, you know, not calling it directly to them, not, you know, addressing them as busters or, North, North, or farmeros, but you know, he would be talking to his homies and he would use those words so that the North Daniels could hear, you know, hear the phrases that he was using. And it, it was disrespectful. That's straight, you know, a direct disrespect. So he became a target. Rock from Corona became one of their targets. And it was basically at this point where they're like, you know what, you know, we're at a point where these guys are trying to dictate our program. So you know, this is what we have to do. We have to, you know, basically pick our targets and we need to take flight. So we need to, you know, take off on anybody that we feel might be supporting it or, you know, the guys that are responsible for, you know, pushing the disrespect that's been happening on this yard. So that's where they were they were kind of at. They were, you know, at an at an impasse, the, the North Daniels out there. They didn't know if they should take off right there because Taking off, you're giving up the yard. There were North Daniels out there. They had finally started to establish a household. And, you know, on one hand, they couldn't allow themselves to be dictated. But on the other hand, you know, they were they broke ground. They have North Daniels out there on these yards that haven't been out there in years. So that was a major accomplishment. And, you know, they're at a, a, a point now where they have to make a decision. What's, you know, what's in our best interest? You know, we can't allow ourselves to be dictated, but at the same time, you know, looking at the bigger picture, we're trying to, you know, open up this 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 house right here for other North Daniels. You know, a similar situation like this had unfolded previously before this, you know, happened with Rock with a guy named Lupe from Orange County. According to Stomper, this guy was, you know, he was similar. He was disrespectful. He was somebody that was out there trying to, you know, dictate you know, policies to the North Daniels, telling them they couldn't do this or they couldn't sit over there or these tables, you know, they only had these, whatever they were, he was doing, he was being disrespectful. And it got to the point where at that point, there was only a couple of North Daniels out there. There was probably like a handful of them and they sent three cats on him, but it was just, you know, it was just fisticuffs. They, they rushed him. They didn't use a weapon. And I'm surprised that they didn't use a weapon, but these guys must have, they must have been youngsters or they just hit that yard or it was like a spur of the moment type of thing. But at any rate, when that happened, they ended up rushing Lupe at yard recall and they all got rolled up. So they lost that yard. So they had to start all over again. They had to you know, send a couple of other North Daniels out there you know, sometime later and either they made it or they started, you know, they stayed out there and they, they started to build again. But when these these other North Daniels, when they rushed Lupe, apparently they got sent to a place. They got sent to an ad seg that was called the Palace. It was a different kind of ad seg. It ran different from the other ad segs in Pelican Bay. I don't know if it was a new ad seg, one that they just built. But what it was is it was like you were slammed down. The doors were the kind of doors that were made so that you couldn't fish. The doors, you know, the cracks were blocked so you couldn't get a visual down the tier. Like you were shut down and you were behind a solid door. So it was hard to communicate. You could barely hear. So, you know, they apparently they called that place the palace. But that's where the North Daniels that rushed Lupe, that's where they ended up. at. So, you know, we're, we're out here on the yard and building three. They're still they're being disrespectful out there and. You know, the, these North Daniels that are out there, like I said, they're at a, they're at a place where they're trying to figure out what's what's the best, you know, their next best move. And that individual rock from Corona, he wasn't helping the situation because, you know, this all happened on the cusp of, you know, him drinking and he, he was just being disrespectful. 
And all this stuff started happening at around the same time. So the tension was starting to build. Things were starting to escalate on that yard and something was about to kick off. So what ended up happening was when one of the Northaniels went out on some type of outside medical appointment, he ended up running into NF member Stork from Salas. He ran into Stork. And this was on a fluke. But Stork, at that time, he was housed in the shoe. But they ran into each other on the van. And this is when this Northaniel, you know, he ran everything down to Stork. And basically, you know, he looked to Stork for direction on, hand to hand, on how to handle it. Stork basically gave him a green light to take flight on any of their targets and anyone else who they felt like, you know, that was behind them being disrespected. So Stork, you know, he basically gave them the blessings to go ahead and kick that off. You know, he's like, you know what, you guys are out there and bottom line is this, if you're out there and you guys are trying to program out there and you're being dictated or you feel like these guys are, are, are trying to dictate your guys' program and they're trying to hold you guys down like that and you got this other individual that's just straight being disrespectful, go ahead, whack them, do what you guys got to do. You can't stay out there on a yard like this. If these guys are not willing to work with you guys, if they're not willing you know, to give you guys the respect that you got coming, that mutual respect and allow you guys to program out there with, you know, without all the YA games and all the other shit that's going on out there, then you guys got to do what you got to do. You got to go out there and handle your business. So what ended up happening is, you know, they formulated a plan just like any other removal when you're going to go out there and whack somebody. You pick the best time, the best place. Usually, you know, somebody's programmed their routine. You're going to hit them somewhere on the yard. Is, is it a blind spot? And then, you know, all the other things come into play when you're out there actually getting ready for go time. Where's the gunner at? You know, who's out there on the yard? You know, all these things are, are things you're going to take into consideration. So, you know, after they get all this down and they, they have their plan, you know, in effect, that's when it was go time. Now, the one thing that Stomper did say that kind of helped these, these guys to their advantage was that the North Daniels, being that they were down in numbers, they ran a tight program. And whenever they moved around on the yard, they always moved around in sets of two. So, you know, this kind of helped them in this situation because, you know, when this happened, they were moving around in sets of two, squads of two, and it didn't look like they were up to nothing you know, nothing about their movement, you know, raised any red flags. So these guys are are picking their targets. They're out there on the yard. They put three guys on Rock. And like I said, Rock was the way Stomper described him. He was a big, heavy set dude. And they sent three guys on him. But this youngster, this one youngster in particular from Salinas, I don't know if it was the youngster that had the, the SK tattoo on his shoulder, but... This youngster st stabbed Rock bad, like Stomper said, you know, and Stomper's a, a, a former Sureño, but he said, you know, they 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 caught us slipping. You know, the bottom line is they caught us slipping out there that day. They got Rock bad, though. This youngster, he stabbed the shit out of Rock. I don't know if he was slicing him up or stabbing him, but, you know, when this youngster was going in on Rock and these other two guys were stabbing Rock, there was three of them stabbing him at the same time. Some other Sureños ran over there to assist him, and they said that this youngster would not let go of his weapon. They, at some point, I guess, they they rushed him, they got a hold of him, and they were trying to take the piece from him, but they said this fool would not let the weapon go. He was holding on to that weapon for dear life, and at some point, Weddle from, from Montclair, he even, you know, he even tried to bite this youngster's hand. That's and he still didn't let go. I believe that this youngster knew that if he let go of that weapon, it was cookies for him. It was it was going to be all bad. You know, he probably held on to that that weapon thinking that if I let go, they're going to kill me with this weapon. But, you know, that's that's what Stomper said that, you know, they did rock. They did him bad. They caught him slipping. He was a big dude. He couldn't get away. He was too big to run. So he basically had to stand there and fight and they were working him. While he was getting hit, they had several other targets out there that were getting hit at the same time. You know, when they're when they're going in on rock, the gun tower, they start bucking. They start shooting at, at you know, they start shooting at these guys, but they're shooting 
the the gas gun, the 37 millimeter non-lethal rounds, the, the knee knockers or the big Berthas. So, you know, they see Rock getting stabbed. They take a couple of shots at him until they, they take off with the Mini-14. They chamber the Mini-14. They got off one round. And, you know, that was just one situation that was happening. Over here on this side of the yard, you know, they're... Until they get these guys under control. So finally... That's, that's it. You guys ain't getting no more. So finally, they end up getting the whole yard down. They get everybody proned out and, you know, they get them all in cuffs and they end up taking them all to ad set. You know, so when, when this incident, when it was all said and done, obviously these North Daniels, they ended up losing that yard again. The administration, from what Stomper told me, they ended up taking all these North Daniels off the yard. And it was it's a shame because... You know, apparently before this incident kicked off, these guys were trying to program. They, you know, a couple of the guys that, that were out there on the yard, they were guys that had been around. They knew how to do time and they were running a tight program. They had their, you know, the, the North Daniels that were out there. They, you know, had them treating everybody out there with respect. They had a, a you know, a good program. But, you know, on the on the flip side, Unfortunately, there wasn't nobody out there to guide these youngsters, you know, in building three. And that's basically where, you know, everything derived from, you know, what was going on in that building. And, you know, that's a lot of the times, you know, these wars that happened back in the 80s and the 90s, you know, that's what it was over. It was, it was because you would get some youngsters out there in one of these yards that started playing YA games. You know, they would start striking up their hoods on the walls, you know, putting graffiti, you know, on tables, scratching them up somewhere. And, you know, that's just, it's disrespectful. It's disrespectful. And then, you know, the mean mugging, the eye fucking and all that stuff, you know, poking their chest out, you know, North Daniels do that. Youngsters, when, when we used to catch these youngsters do, doing that shit, we put them in check real quick, you know, but, you're not always going to have somebody out there to guide these guys right. And unfortunately, when that when a situation like that happens, the, the ending result is what you're going to get. You know, somebody getting stabbed, these guys losing the yard. So anyways, that's what happened, in, you know, with this incident right here. This was a, one situation, one of several that ended up happening out there. And, you know, obviously years later, a couple of years later, if my timing's right, when Palomino drove up, they were still not allowing North Daniels to program on that yard. So, you know, again, like I said, if the timing, if my timing is right, these incidents that I just told you guys about, this happened, you know, a year or two before Palomino ended up getting there or a couple years before he got there then he would end up driving up and there were still no North Daniels out there. They weren't allowing them to program on A or B yard. And then you had, you know, the, the trip with the Fresno Bulldogs when they came in, you know, all, all that, you know, is, is in the history books now though. Now, obviously you guys know that they got the, you know, the agreement to end hostilities out there and there's no more bloodshed. These kind of stories there, you know, from the past, some of us been through those, you know, those years. A lot of the youngsters that are out there now that are, you know, part of the agreement to end hostilities, they didn't experience that. There were some crazy times, you know, there was wars would kick off over the, the, the dumbest shit, you know, over the, uh, the, the smallest measure of disrespect. Somebody mean mugging somebody, somebody bumping into somebody. You guys know in prison, respect is predicated on everything, everything. And if you don't maintain your respect in prison, people are going to walk all over you. So this is one of those stories that, you know, kind of tells you what happens when that happens. Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this story. I got some more stories that I'm working on for you guys right now. I'm going to try to, you know, get out a war story for you guys. It's been a long time since I dropped a war story. Again, some of you have been asking me to bring that series back. I don't know if I'm going to bring it all the way back, but at least every now and then, I'm going to try to drop one or two for you guys. And I'm still going to be doing the inner demons. 
I was going to try to do a hat trick tonight, but I don't think it's going to happen. Anyways, with that being said, I hope you guys had a good night. I hope you're ready for this weekend. I hope you're ready for this, this giveaway that we're going to be doing. And again, if you guys don't know, let me tell you. So now you know. You guys don't have to put your name in. You don't have to submit your name for any, you know, for this giveaway that we're going to be doing this week, the gift card giveaway. All you got to do is pull up, just be there. And, you know, you have a, a chance at being a potential winner. So again, I'll let you guys know Friday, which is tomorrow. I'll let you guys know at some point tomorrow when we're going to be doing it either Saturday or Sunday. So you guys that want to win a gift card, have a little bit of extra cash in your pocket. You don't have to, you know, you guys don't have to buy no tickets. You don't have to do nothing, but just show up for that live. Anyway, with that being said, I hope you enjoyed this story. I hope you're ready for the weekend. I hope you are going to participate in this giveaway. This is your boy B and I'm out.